The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar, which, as you can see on the title screen here, is called... Oh, I've lost the screen. There we go. Avoiding charity pitfalls and staying out of trouble. My name is Matt Crichton, and today I'm joined by the Director of our Compliance Directorate here at the ACNC, Prue Monument. Hello, Prue. Hi. Hi, everyone. We've got a lot to get through, so we'll just give you a brief overview of what's coming up. But oh, actually, before that, just some sort of admin stuff. Um, we have uh, a couple of colleagues, Chris and Jill, currently standing by to answer your questions as we go through the broadcast. So if you have anything that pops into your mind and you want to ask the question, at that time, feel free to use the chat um, part of your navigation there and you can um, get a question to them and they'll be able to respond to you. If you have any trouble with the audio for the webinar, um, one option is to uh, dial in. Um, the confirmation email that you received when you registered will have had some details about how to do this. You, you dial a number, you put in a code and then you can hear the, the webinar through your phone instead of the uh, whatever internet connection you've got. Um, and as we do go through with uh, through the broadcast, if, if you'd rather keep your questions to the end, then that's another option. We're going to set aside a few minutes at the end to address any questions that come up throughout. And um, yeah, that, that way you can listen to what we have to say and then ask any questions that, of stuff that we, we might not have covered. And finally, there will be a few references to um, websites and, and, and resources on the slides as we go through. There's no need to jot them all down as we go because um, we are recording this and it will be published on our website later on and you can go back and have a look at it. And also, um, we'll send you a follow-up email either today or to, to, to not tomorrow. Tomorrow's a day off, so today, um, which contains all the links in it as well. All right, now, having said all that, we can get back to the presentation proper and we'll just give you an overview of what there is to come today. We'll have a look at first um, the ACNC Compliance Report, a compilation of um, uh, stats and figures and lots of information about what has happened over the past 12 months. Uh, we'll then look at some gen general charity issues, pitfalls and, and how best to avoid them if you are involved in a charity. Just some reminders of what the duties for charities are for being registered with the ACNC. And then we'll have a look at some compliance focuses for 2019, which may give you an indication of the sorts of things that, that we'll be looking at and the, the, the sorts of uh, uh, things that charities can do to avoid these little particular issues. And finally, we'll give you a brief um, intro to what's called the External Conduct Standards, which is a set of governance standards for organisations that do some work overseas. Okay. That's a lot of talking from me, so I'm going to pass over to Prue to take over. But Prue, can you just give us an overview? As the screen shows here, we've had this compliance report released this month. Actually, in fact, it was this week, wasn't it? Last week. Last week, sorry. Um, the compliance report is released. Can you give us an overview of what first what the compliance report is? Um, and then we'll get into some of the stats and, and figures. Sure. So the... ACNC Charity Compliance Report is a report that we um, produce each year um, and it looks at the, the previous calendar year's uh, compliance activities uh, that the ACNC has undertaken. So we look at uh, how many investigations we've run, uh, we look at what enforcement action we've taken um, and the work we've done to get a lot of charities back on track. And we like to, where possible, even though we often can't go into a lot of detail because of our secrecy provisions, we like to share our learning through uh, different scenarios and case studies with the sector. And in the one released last week, um, we've got some feature um, uh, stats and information on the screen here. Can you take us through some of these? Yeah, sure. So we have quite a, um, the ACNC is quite a small regulator and uh, we have a, a fairly small compliance team, but uh, they finalised 90 investigations in 2018 and many of those involve quite a lot of work. So a really great out outcome for uh, the ACNC, but the sector more broadly. Um, the bulk of our work is really focused on getting good charities back on track. And right. most charities are trying to do the right thing, but things go wrong. And so you can see that we enter into um, compliance agreements. So there's 
with 24 compliance agreements. They're voluntary agreements with charities and we set out some areas um, that the charity can improve on and we monitor their compliance with those changes. Sometimes we need to use more, more uh, formal powers and we will issue an enforceable undertaking or we've uh, issued a few directions there um, where we formally require charities to uh, make certain changes or take certain action. And some details around those where we've used those formal powers um, will be published on our website and people can have a look uh, at those summaries. Um, also, a figure that's not there that I think is very mm -hmm. important is that we issued 71 pieces of regulatory advice. So okay. often when we come out and investigate a matter, um, or sometimes we establish we don't need to investigate, we can just give the charity some regulatory guidance and right. advice, clarify something we think that perhaps they don't entirely understand and that's sufficient to get them back on track. Yeah, right. Um, and this is an interesting stat. It, it shows uh, sort of the, the, the significance of the work of the Compliance Directorate in monetary terms. Absolutely. And, you know, part of our risk-based approach, um, we look at the, the potential harms that are occurring when things go wrong, but we also look at, at the scale uh, of the matter. So while not all of our compliance and investigation work will focus on large charities, um, in many instances it does. And we all know that the charity sector so the charity sector is substantial uh, and is the second largest um, employer to, to retail. So many of the organisations that we're working with um, have uh, substantial revenue and assets. Yeah, right. Um, and just some other details. You mentioned that it's not not always the high profile stuff where a charity's lost its registration or is, is, is on that page on our website where we publish some of the formal um, uh, powers that we've used. There's a lot of work that goes into some of the stuff that, that isn't seen, right? Absolutely. And so every year, uh, the number of concerns that the ACNC receives continues to increase. We can't investigate everything. Yeah, right. So we do put apply quite a lot of rigour um, in terms of a triage and risk assessment process to determine uh, what we are going to um uh, investigate or where we can apply um, a more minimal intervention such as providing some regulatory advice and we recently introduced a, a self-evaluation tool um, that we're sending to more charities as well yep. so boards can contemplate their own um, governance practices but um, you know the reason we're receiving more concerns I don't think it is that um, there's more problems in the mm. sector. I think people better understand the role of the ACNC right. and the more action we take, um, it, it generates further interest and understanding about um, our role in the sector. Now, large charities do tend to be overrepresented in our work um, and we we feel the reason for that is um, also due to the fact that there's more people involved in larger charities, yep. people, um, more people that have opportunities to identify or escalate um, concerns to us. Right. Well, there are, um, as, the, as the compliance report has shown us, there are um, a few key areas of concern that have popped up um, through our work, and this may apply, well, you might recognise some of these just broader issues in your own charity. Um, we hope they're not you know, major issues that you have to deal with, but you may re um, recognise just some of the, the broader issues that um, come up out of these. So the first one is um, private benefit. Um, conflicts of interest is another one that um, has popped up um, a fair bit in, in our work and our compliance work over the past 12 months, and also financial mismanagement. Prue, can you just take us through some of these? We'll start at the top. We'll start with private benefit. What does that mean? Look, um, private benefit is where um, we see charities' resources being used to, to benefit people that are linked to the charity or, or other individuals other than the charity's funds being used for the charity's beneficiaries or to um, advance the charity's purpose. And that gives us great reason for concern. Because charities must um, maintain their, their not-for-profit status um, and must be for the public benefit. Yeah, right. And that's that comes, um, well, obviously, there, there may be cases where there is um, deliberate private benefit involved, but it can also come 
unknowingly, right, just with some maybe some poor practices or poor poor um, governance or poor understanding that leads to um, troubles of private benefit that maybe people in the charity didn't quite know they were getting down that route. Absolutely. And look, in our investigations work, we do see, unfortunately, some instances of, of willful private benefit where the charity's been structured um, knowingly in a specific way to afford individuals a private benefit. But as you say, in many cases, um, it's just because uh, there was some poor governance um, or misunderstanding that, that these things have happened and we're able to rectify these problems and get charities back on track. And some of the issues that, or some of the unknowing private benefit, I suppose, is related to this concept of related parties, which which has a, a connection to private benefit. Can you, this might be an unfamiliar term to a lot of people, but once it's explained, they may recognise the concept. What, what is a related party? Look, a related party is really a person or an organisation that has... Um, potential to have influence over the charity, um, the charity's finances or the charity's operations. It, well, often we see it as involving a family member or a friend of someone that's um, working in the charity or runs the charity and a related party can be a person or an organisation. Right. And what can um, charities or, or people involved in charities do to um, address private benefit or even better, avoid private benefit when it comes up? Look, I think that there's a number of important things that charities can do to avoid um, private benefit. Need to always be mindful um, or ensure that the, the charity is, um, any expenditure uh, of charity funds is in pursuit of the charitable purpose. Yep. Um, and the charity needs to remain not for profit. It shouldn't be delivering uh, any individuals um, uh, that private benefit or, or, or profit. Yep. Um, conflicts of interest need to be carefully managed. Now, I know we're going to talk a little bit further about conflicts of, of interest in, in a moment, but really where we see organisations trip up here is that um, they often think that they're making decisions based on, based on trust. So, for example, if I was operating a charity and my brother had a merchandise business, I think, oh, okay, that's great. I know my brother. Um, I'm going to engage his merchandise business and a lot of charity funds go um, over to, to his business to produce the, the merchandise. Um, now, look, this doesn't have to be a problem. Yeah. As long as the charity goes through a considered process process of, and we would call this due diligence, look at what other options are out there. Yeah. Who else can produce merchandise for the charity? And do some cost benefit analysis. Who's going to deliver the best value um, for the charity? And certainly then when you have a few options and, and you can weigh those up, um, you can make a more informed decision. And uh, if, if it did relate to my brother, of course, I would have to remove myself from that decision because yeah. there would be that direct conflict and that related party um, arrangement in place. So it, it's practical things like that and, and we will talk about conflicts of interest um, as we move forward. And of course, there are the governance standards which underpin all the um, uh, operations of a, of a charity registered with the ACNC. That, that's right. And governance standard one is, is about purpose and not for profit, which we've already talked about. Now, governance standard five is um, the, the steps that the charity must take to ensure its responsible persons um, act in certain ways. And, and one of the uh, obligations is around care and due diligence. Yep. And this is where it's really important when um, working with related parties that you do take care and you do go through a due diligence process and make sure that you're always acting um, in the best interest of the charity. Now we have a lot of information about all of these concepts on the website and there are a few links here to specific resources but as, as I said at the beginning you don't have to drop these down right now you receive a follow-up email with all of these links in them. Um, okay let's get on to financial, for the financial mismanagement. Now this is something that I, I think a lot of people would um, automatically think of when they're thinking of charity problems, charity issues and a regulator getting involved. Finances is one of the things that pops up. Um, what It is a wide-ranging term as the slide says but what sort of things does it cover? 
Look, uh, financial mismanagement can happen in any organisation and is certainly not just limited to the charity sector, but it does cover a very wide range of behaviours, um, inappropriate use of uh, money, it can be fraud, misappropriation, embezzlement, um, inadequate or, or no budgeting and um, a lack of any sort of proper financial controls. And again, similar to the private benefit thing and, and conflicts of interest, um, avoiding this or, or addressing financial mismanagement really rests heavily on the um, policies or processes um, and procedures maybe that a charity has in place to be able to to be able to manage funds uh, transparently, responsibly and openly. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, obviously in the sector there's charities of all different shapes and sizes and so each charity has to understand its risks um, and has to have policies and procedures and processes in, in place to um, articulate those risks and, and mitigate those risks. But really it, it should be clear for an outsider um, to see based on policies or procedures how a charity is protecting um, its finances and it might include things like um, how many uh, you know, approvals required, having more than one person with control over, over the finances and making sure you have multiple people that have to approve uh, expenditure. And things like financial delegations and approvals, who within the charity is authorised to spend money and, and how far does that spending uh, extend and who's going to approve um, that spending ahead of that, that money um, being uh, applied. I think uh, also another um, important aspect is that the board or, or the committee, the people responsible for operating the charity have regular um, and sufficient oversight of the financial reports and receive regular financial reporting updates. Um, and I think security around your passwords, access to bank accounts, um, minimising cash uh, wherever possible is also really important. But one thing that we haven't got listed there, which is also really important, is appropriate reconciliations because right, that really right. helps you identify where um, things may be going wrong. Mm, you know, yeah. if people are spending money, then they should be required to produce receipts and and um, there should be a, a formal reconciliation process um, to match uh, spending and for the charity to have full confidence that that spending was A, approved and um, was required to um, progress the charity's purpose or align with the charity's purpose. Yeah, and an interesting one here, a culture of financial questioning. Um, an interesting turn of phrase. What, what, do, we, what do we mean by this um, when, when we're speaking of people involved in the charity? What, what, what should they be questioning? What are we talking about? Look, I think that um, it's really important, policies and procedures and these things are, are all well and good, but if you don't have a, a culture um, that uh, questions um, things that appear a little bit out of the ordinary right. or if um, reconciliations don't seem appropriate, um, then there's a problem. And I think also the board or the committee, if they're receiving financial uh, reports or audit reports, they should feel empowered to, to question the information yep. they're receiving and make sure that they're fully comfortable uh, with it, that they understand it, um, because that's the best way to pick up problems early. Yeah, it certainly um, helps to contribute to the broader transparency if everyone knows that everyone else is looking for things and is happy to question things, then it's, it's much, much harder to, for things to go undetected. Absolutely. Again, some more information about the financial stuff in particular, which will be included in the follow-up email. Um, there's a particular, uh, there's a resource on fraud in particular and, and also managing charity money broadly, which you may find uh, useful for your charity. Now, you did mention earlier, Prue, that we we're going to talk about conflicts of interest. The time has arise, uh, arrived. Um, you did give it a description before. Just, just once more, a br brief overview for people that might be unfamiliar with um, the term. I, I think even if the term conflict of interest isn't familiar, at least the concept will certainly ring true. Yeah, and look, I think that this is um, 
an area that we often find charities really struggle with. Mm -hmm. Um, So Mm -hmm. as you can see there, I think that's quite a neat definition of a conflict of interest when someone's personal interests perhaps are conflicting with their responsibility to act in the best interests of the charity where they have um, a role. Um, So it's really important that that people um, are mindful of this and that it's managed effectively. Now we have a few types of conflicts of interest and and there may be some uh, subtle differences but nonetheless important differences here which are are worth teasing out a little bit. The first one here we have actual conflicts of interest. Um, Prue, can you give an overview of what this means? It probably sounds self-explanatory but it's worth just teasing out a little bit. Yeah, so look, um, an actual conflict of interest is a situation where without a a doubt you are being influenced by um, a conflict that you have and it might be um, your personal involvement in a matter or your relationship to an individual. So for example, um, if the the board or the committee were making decisions around increasing your remuneration and you're part of that board um, and you think that it's appropriate to uh, remain in part of that discussion and vote in favour of increasing your salary, yeah. well, That is without a doubt an actual conflict because you are being influenced by your own self-interest in this decision. And just contrast that to the next one, which is a potential conflict of interest. There's a subtle difference here. Yeah, look, I think that a potential conflict of interest is far more subtle um, and uh, a little bit more difficult to to manage. So... A potential conflict of interest might be one um, where you have a a friendship or a relationship with a a professional organisation that is providing um, some subject matter expertise to to the charity Um, and so there there is a potential um, should you have to make uh, decisions in relation to that professional relationship for there to be a a conflict. So it hasn't actually occurred yet but but there's the potential if the charity is going to engage this organisation and and you are friends with or you know the people um, um, that operate that accounting firm or that law firm, for example. Yeah, it might not be as clear cut as that first example we described, but certainly th- th- there's a possibility, and and at least the other people involved could see that there's a p- potential that it's going to be an actual conflict of interest. Which does bring us to the third one, this concept of perception. Now, the perceived conflict of interest, as it says here, it says you could appear to be influenced by conflicting interest. How does this differ from the other two? Well, look, I think that the perceived conflict of interest is um, a situation where we are confident that a conflict of interest hasn't actually occurred. But perhaps because there's a lack of um, transparency around how the situation was managed, to an outsider, there's still a perception um, that that there was a conflict. So, for example, if um, the the charity decides to I- engage the accounting firm in where your friend worked, um, but you removed yourself from anything to do with that consideration and other accounting firms were considered in that process, but nonetheless um, a decision was made to engage with that firm where your friend works, If people aren't aware of how um, that process was managed to A, acknowledge a potential conflict existed and remove um, yourself from any of the decision making, make sure there was adequate due diligence, then for others there may be a perception um, that that a conflict has actually occurred and you've been part of that decision making um, process. And it's really important that charities are transparent around this stuff because the perceived conflict of interest can damage um, the reputation of a a charity just as much as an actual conflict. Yeah, right, and in that sense it's um, effectively the same thing. Whether or not there is an actual conflict or not, the perception is such that it damages the charity's reputation and image and and it it may as well have been an actual conflict of interest. Absolutely. Um, Now, this is an important point, though. We talk about conflicts of interest and how they can be a problem for a charity, depending on how they're managed, but, of course, they don't have to be a problem, right? 
they don't have to be a problem. That's right. And it all comes down to how you manage this and having your um, processes well documented. So there is that transparency for uh, members, beneficiaries, the broader community in relation to um, how you record, um, recognise and, and deal with uh, potential conflicts. And if it's not to be a problem, there are some things that a charity can do to address it so that if they do come up against a conflict of interest, which which it's worth pointing out, are pretty common. Um, it's, Very common. Yeah, you don't have to avoid them at all costs and, and, and treat them like a, um, a real blight on your charity's operations. It's something that you just have to come across every now and then. There are some, some things that a charity can do. Um, Prue, what are some of the best things or at least – some of the things the ACNC compliance team will, will advise charities on. Yeah, look, we will encourage charities to have a, a written policy that explains how they um, uh, manage conflicts of interest um, and that, you know, is a good uh, flag for others to, to outline what we can expect of the charity. And the charities should also have a register of interest. So, for the people that um, the, re the responsible persons of the charity, so the people on the committee or the board, there should be a register that lists their their interests and where they're particularly where there may be a potential conflict, and that should be reviewed regularly. So is that just a sort of a list that's kept somewhere where where you 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 jot down all the all the potential or the interests that the people have, which may then at some point may become a, a, yeah. a conflict. Yeah, they may conflict with the, the charity's best interests at some point. So that's e exactly right. And a, a good way to, to do this and to keep that register fresh is at um, board meetings um, to have a standing agenda item around conflicts of interest. Right. And so you then are asking uh, the board members or the committee, are there any new interests that people declare, uh, need to declare? And it's also a really good practice to ask them to declare whether they have any conflicts with the agenda of that particular meeting. Right, yep, that's a good idea. And this third point, think carefully, if in doubt, declare. Absolutely. You know. If there's no harm in declaring. No, there's no. no harm and there should be no reason for embarrassment or concern about declaring um, potential uh, conflicts. And, of course, do it beforehand. It's no good post hoc deciding that it would have been good to declare, so I declared it. Do it at the beginning. Absolutely. Get it up front. Absolutely. Okay, and, of course, as Prue mentioned, don't be embarrassed to declare. And this comes back to the the, um, the point we mentioned in the financial mismanagement bit about a culture of questioning. The same concept applies to conflicts of interest. Have a culture of openness, of transparency, so that the idea of declaring a conflict of interest is just merely an administrative task that you do every board meeting. It's not, it's not anything to be embarrassed about or anything to worry about. Again, we have lots of information on conflicts of interest on the website. So um, we'll include this in the in the follow up email. It's worth um, printing out maybe some of these guides if you think that your charity it's something that will benefit your charity, or you think that um, it's something that your charity needs to to deal with because you've come across this problems with this in the past. Let's have a look at some charity duties now. Um, these are some of the things that a registered charity must do um, to remain registered with the ACNC and to as the title of the webinar suggests, avoid pitfalls. Um, Prue, can you take us through some of these? The first one here says governance standards. Sure. So um, under the ACNC uh, regulation, uh, there is a set of governance standards that any charity registered with the ACNC um, must comply with. Um, and where a lot of our investigation work focuses um, is in relation to governance standard five, mm -hmm. um, which is really pertains to what steps the charity is taking to ensure its responsible persons are uh, exercising their responsibilities appropriately. So things we've already talked about, are, yep. you know, due diligence, um, acting in the best interests of the charity, ensuring proper financial controls. Yep. Charities are also required um, to report annually to the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission um, and uh, that's through an annual information statement. And charities are also required to keep keep records uh, so that um, 
uh, well, I mean, it's just, it, 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 you know, they're required to keep records and it makes it certainly easier if we have a need to um, engage with the charity for them to explain their operations, to have um, minutes of meetings, to have some written policies and, and procedures. And look, we do appreciate that um, that will look quite different mm. um, for each charity. Yep. And what that looks like for a small charity um, will be very different to what it looks like for a really large charity. Um, so I think it's important that um, you know, people on the line realise that um, you know, we 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 know that one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, right. um, but the key is really uh, about um, understanding your risks, having some processes in place to mitigate them, and to respond if things do go wrong. Yeah. So to think about what you do as a charity and and apply this idea of keeping records to your activities and operations. That's why we, we sort of can't be prescriptive no. when we say keep records. It really does depend on many factors within your organisation and what it does, but um, it, it, it does need to keep records that, that show um, its, its operations and its finances and that sort of thing. And finally, there is one more here to talk about, notifying of changes. Yeah, and look, it's really important that um, a charity let us know um, if there's any uh, changes to um, the responsible persons that um, are managing the organisation. And beyond just the, um, the the legislative requirement that you have to do this if you want to remain registered with the ACNC, it's a good idea for a charity to, in, in facing the public, to be open, transparent, and to have these sorts of details up to date on the public facing charity register. You, you want to have your current address, your current list of um, responsible persons and, and um, your annual information statement submitted on time and, and there for viewer. It, it shows a, a commitment to accountability and transparency that, that the knock on effect of which is that it's um, a good reputational thing for your charity. It is a really good um, reputational uh Thing for the charity and I think for charities that have websites and most charities do these days yeah. I think that if the charity has written policies around conflicts of interest or how it um, controls its finances then they should really um, yeah. publish those on their own website as well because I think that if someone within the charity has a question or a concern they can they can go there they can have a look they can get a better understanding of how the charity manages these issues. And just at the bottom there, you'll see a link to, this is a new thing actually, uh, the website acnc.gov.au forward slash self-evaluation. It's the uh, resource that Prue mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar, a, a new little self-help um, resource, what you could call it, um, sort of a checklist, sort of a guide that, that helps you get your head around these sorts of things and, and um, how you can apply some of these these rules and, and some of these best practice principles to your own your own charity. And again, this link will be in the, the follow-up email. So um, if, if you want to wait for that one, that's uh, good. But if you want to jot this one down, it's a, it's a good new one to have a look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look at the focus for 2019, which um, will have been uh, shaped by what we found in 2018, I presume. Yeah, look, it, it is. And... Um you know, I think that our focus, uh, we we still focus our compliance resources um, around four key risk areas. So, um, as I touched on earlier, we receive a huge number of, of concerns. And um, so we want to make sure that we're investing our time and energy in those issues that we think are going to undermine trust and confidence in the sector. And so we fo focus our, our compliance and investigation work around fraud and financial mismanagement. So this includes money laundering, tax avoidance, private benefit. We also focus on terrorism and that can be the misuse of a charity for terrorist um, purposes or to foster extremism uh, and it, that includes um, supporting terrorism financially or, or otherwise. And um, our focus in 2019 is uh, around charities that also fail to safeguard people. Right. And safeguarding is is a word that really what it means is is protect right. people, um, keep people safe from harm. Yep. And so in previous years, our focus has been very much on um, 
protecting the charity's beneficiaries, children and vulnerable adult in, mm -hmm. adults in particular. But we've broadened it out and our expectation is that charities should protect anyone that yeah, comes right. into contact with the charity, whether they be uh, a volunteer, a beneficiary, a formal employee, a contractor, etc. Um, and when I say that they should protect these people, we understand at the ACNC and a theme that really ran through the compliance report this year is that we understand there can never be zero risk. Yep. There can never be zero risk in um, charities. There never can be zero risk in any organisation. Mm -hmm. But the key is to understand your risk, mm -hmm. uh, have strategies in place to manage and mitigate those risks and respond swiftly and appropriately when things do go wrong to, to address these matters um, in, in the best possible way and to learn, yep. to continue to review and learn um, from uh, these situations where things do go wrong and how you can improve your, your processes further. The compliance report had a great there's a great case study in there from um, Guide Dogs Victoria, a, a fantastic example of things going wrong, um, but a great zero tolerance approach to addressing it. Look, the one other priority area we focus on is political or unlawful activities. So charities can't have a political purpose. Very important this time. Oh, it is timely. This yeah. time of year, um, going into an election period, uh, charities can't uh, promote or oppose one particular candidate candidate or party for office and um, they shouldn't have an unlawful purpose either. So look, that's where we focus um, uh, our attention but we're also getting better at proactively identifying and addressing risk. And right. what we mean there is that we don't just wait for the community or people within charities to tell us there's a problem. Um, the more we understand about charities and the more data we have from charities um, and we can often get data from other government agencies as yeah, well, right. we think about what the risk indicators are and we use that data to um, try and identify risks that uh, are not yet known to us right. or haven't been raised with us. And uh, in 2017, 8% of our compliance work was proactively identified by us. Yeah, um, right. Sorry, that was in 2017. In 2018, 20%. So we're oh, okay. really increasing our capability yeah, yeah. in that regard, which is uh, a fantastic result. What is the Financial Action Task Force? It's something that features in the compliance um, uh, priorities for the year and, and in the report. What, what is this and what do we have to do? Sure. Look, the Financial Action Task Force is a, an international organisation that most countries around the world are signatory to and Australia is signatory, signatory to the Financial Action Task Force. The Financial Action Task Force um, have a number of recommendations for countries that they should implement to reduce the risk of terrorism financing or money laundering. Right. And there are some specific recommendations that relate to the charities and not-for-profit sector. Okay. And why it's a focus for us this year is that they're coming back to Australia this year to conduct a five-year review of oh, how... Okay how effective we are right. at um, identifying terrorism financing and money laundering risks and um, addressing those risks. So uh, the ACNC has done a lot of great work in, in this regard. We have some um, excellent resources on our website, but we also do very targeted um, outreach to charities that we think might be at a higher risk of misuse for these purposes. And this one is something to look out for, um, a, a suite of new resources that will be published soon, which will help lots of charities in um, a, a range of areas or four main um, areas of concern, which, uh, the, as it's called here, the Governance Toolkit will provide um, some easy to use uh, resources, fact sheets and um, other templates to, for charities to be able to uh, turn their mind to a few uh, key areas of, of uh, governance, uh, potential risk or, or, or failures or issues that, that they might not have otherwise, and it'll help them to uh, you know focus their own their own work. Do you want to just have a give a quick overview of the the four key areas that we're going to provide some resources for with the governance toolkit? Sure. So the four key areas that we're going to provide. Um, 
guidance to um, is around protecting people. So I mentioned about the safeguarding. Cybersecurity. So we, we know that many charities are increasingly struggling to um, manage cybersecurity risks. Uh, so we'll have some great resources there. Um, we'll have resources in relation to working with partners. So some of those challenges, we, we discussed conflicts of interest, related party transactions. We really hope the resource um, supports charities to navigate um, that, those challenges um, and financial, financial fraud, financial wrongdoing um, and some of the steps charities can take to, to better protect their, their money. Okay, and finally, the, the external conduct standards is a new set of well, effectively governance standards for charities that have some work overseas. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, you know, on the ground operations overseas. It may be something as remote as sending funds overseas, but it's a, a set of, um, again, governance standards, for, for lack of a better description, for that particular work overseas. So if you're involved in a charity that has some involvement overseas, whether that be sending some funds for use by another organisation overseas, or you, you have some significant operations yourself overseas, the external conduct standards will apply for, will apply to your organisation and, and will be something that we will um, at the ACNC look out for. And the Compliance Directorate in particular is um, working very hard to get their head around what, what these are, what they cover and, and how we're going to apply them. Yeah, and I think that there's no need to panic. Yep. Um, I think that what we expect of charities now through our governance standards, that this is really an extension yep. of that um, in the overseas context. And it's still very much going to be um, focused around what what steps the charity is taking to ensure that um, it's uh, minimising the risk of fraud and corruption, that it's protecting vulnerable people and so on. Um, but we're busy um, working across the ACNC to make sure that there's really practical guidance uh, for the sector ahead of those conduct standards coming into place later this year. Yeah, so look out for those if you've got any involvement overseas. Um, we'll make them known on the website. Okay. Um... And oh, we just spoke about that, and I didn't get to the slide. There we go. Um, they, they will cover they will cover um, activities overseas, including funds, annual um, just reviewing of overseas activities, anti fraud, anti corruption. Many of the themes that Prue has spoken about throughout the webinar. And again, this it's really becoming a, a, a prominent theme in amongst. Um, regulation within charity sectors worldwide, and even more broadly, this idea of protecting vulnerable people. So there'll be um, some um, rules and, and regulations about what a charity must do to, to meet these sorts of uh, meet these uh, obligations. Okay, we're coming towards the end of the formal presentation now. We do have a few questions that have come through, but we will give you just a brief overview of what we covered today. Um, number one, private benefit is a problem. We've found it mm. through our compliance work here. It features in the compliance report fairly prominently. So be familiar with with the ways to address it. Uh, number two, Prue, can you just uh, give them an overview of the second point? Yeah, so make sure that you have clear practical financial controls in help to prevent uh, mismanagement. Um, and, you know, transparency around what those controls are and really driving that, that culture of, of questioning and, and being confident that, you know, it's not just about setting and forgetting about your policies and procedures, but people understand their responsibilities and they're reminded regularly and that they're actually being implemented on the ground. Yeah, and the culture's a really good point. That's something that people forget. It's easy to write a policy and, and save it somewhere, put it in a folder, but if the culture's not there, it's effectively useless. Absolutely, and I think you know the Banking Royal Commission has yep. demonstrated that in a, in a very strong way. You can have the best policies and procedures in the world, but if there's a problem with culture, um, it, it's going to produce some some really bad outcomes. Yeah, for sure. Conflicts of interest are an important thing. They, they always feature um, f for a charity and for lots of organisations, but for charities in particular, it's something that they need to be wary of and just be confident that they have the right processes and, and, and procedures in place to be able to deal with it. So don't think of it as a bad thing or something scary that you really need to avoid at all costs. Just think more about how you are going to deal with the one that pops up. 
And of course, there are certain rules that charities must comply with if they want to remain registered with the ACNC, including rules for governance, reporting, and um, certain record keeping rules as well. And the last points that we just mentioned. Yeah, look, so um, there will be more information coming up on our website shortly in relation to um, the introduction of the external conduct standards. Um, we don't have a set date for the introduction yet and because that's been complicated by the election. Yes. And, and um, But, you know, we anticipate it will be the second half of this calendar year. And as soon as we know the, the date, we will um, share that with the sector. Um, and I encourage you to download the compliance report. It, it provides not only a great overview of the work we've undertaken, it explains our regulatory approach, and it also outlines your obligations from a governance and, and reporting perspective. And of particular value are the scenarios and case yeah, studies. Yeah, for sure. Yep, definitely. Okay, we, we have had a few questions come in. So before we do finish, we'll just run through some of these because I think they might the answers might be useful for our broader audience. Um, an interesting one, Prue, we got is in relation to compliance with a low admin impost. So I think the person's asking about what what can they do if they're in a charity that that either has too few resources or too few people to be able to um, put lots of complicated stuff together to make to maintain compliance. Are there any sort of tips and suggestions that uh, we would have for, for these sorts of organisations to, to help them ensure that they're, they are avoiding pitfalls? Yeah, look, I, I think that um, it, this does come back to each charity understanding its own context, yep. um, the environment in which it operates and what the risks are in that environment and what their capacity and capabilities are within the organisation. And so if it is a small charity, we're not going to expect to see, you know, 50-page um, uh, policies and, and documents, etc. but we are going to want to see, um, the key aspects we're going to want to see is that you understand your risk. So I think every charity should have a risk register yep. and it can just be a basic Excel document. It does not have to mm. be super sophisticated for the smaller <laughs> organisations, but some kind of Excel list that, that shows you've thought about what, what the risks are. And then once you have identified the potential risks, you then link that to, well, what are your strategies currently to mitigate those risks? Is it that you separate the, the financial controls? Is it um, that you you have a, a safeguarding policy to protect children and, and so on? Um, and there's some fantastic resources, not only on our website, but others that help small and medium charities in particular um, with the template policies, um, template procedures. Yeah. And I encourage people to look at that and not feel that they have to recreate the wheel. That's right. Um, that is onerous and that is inefficient. So I encourage people to look at what options are out there. And sometimes even even get right to the real simple things as well. You don't even need to um, have any real um, uh, budget or lots of people to, to have a simple reminder set in your um, shared calendars or something about submitting an annual information statement. Having things like um, annual information statements or updates to charity details with the ACNC as a standing agenda on board meetings or or your even your weekly Monday morning meeting, whatever it may be. Just having these uh, constant little reminders about the things that you have to do to comply with ACNC obligations is um, a really simple but effective way of making sure that you've done a few things to, to meet those obligations. And the self-evaluation checklist is really helpful for yep. that. And, you know, kitchen table governance can work. Yeah, it is. Um, it and, can, yeah. you know, and I think having a tool like that where you are constantly asking you, yourself those questions and what are we doing to understand this and manage it, that's the key. Yep. Someone's asked about working um, with other NGOs or not-for-profits or charities with or without an agreement or an MOU. Um, I, I suppose the getting at the heart of the question is, is sh should we or, or do we have to operate with or without an MOU? And I, and I suppose I, I'll let you continue in a moment, Prue, but it's a common answer with um, many of these things is that it depends on the nature of your work with a partner, uh, what, what you've engaged them to do, how how the roles of both organisations work, it it will it will depend on all those details. And for some, 
Um, absolutely, an MOU or a written agreement is is essential because of the nature of what you're trying to do together. But for others, maybe it's a little bit different and, and you might be able to um, work without that, depending on the closeness of the organisation. But, but in general terms, um, I think it's always best practice to have something written um, to be able to, to help you manage it. Look, I agree. I think it is wherever possible to have something, mm. uh, some form of agreement in writing because I think it also comes back to that um, transparency point that we've talked a lot about today. Um, it tells um, other people about, well, why you're engaging yep. with this other organisation. Uh, how does that relate to your own charitable purpose, particularly if you're committing charity funds to this other organisation to deliver certain um, programs or outcomes? Uh, how are you going to track um, that those outcomes and programs are actually going to be delivered? Because you have to constantly be um, assuring yourself that um, you're pursuing your own charitable purpose. So to see how to articulate how these things align, how you're going to monitor, how you're going to ensure that the funds um, are spent as you intend them to be is really important. And it's important for both parties yep. to, to be clear on that. And it's important point of even protection to you never know what might happen in the future and and we hope that agreements run perfectly as planned but some things change different people get involved and there may be conflicts later on you want to be able to point to something in writing that 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 outlined exactly what you set out to achieve in the beginning and it's really hard to um, deal with those sorts of uh, troubles or conflicts later if you have nothing in writing absolutely it, it will help avoid any sort of future disputes one last one before we finish. Um, what someone's asked about uh, the uh, one I thought was really um, important was about the ideas or tips for oh, organisations yeah. to help ensure they stay up to date with all legislative changes. Um, it is really challenging. Yeah. Um, charities are subject to considerable uh, regulatory oversight, particularly of their fundraising. There's the, the state jurisdiction, Commonwealth jurisdiction, many um, many compliance obligations. So I think some of the useful tips is for charities to subscribe to relevant regulators or peak body news. And we certainly have our um, regular commissioners column and we would include in that any um, updates in relation to legislative change. Um, so that's a really practical way to keep up to date. Um, we have a list of regulators that may uh, affect charities on our website, so that might help people decide where they should start and what they can sign up to. Um, you can check regulators' websites for any updates. And really important, again, it can be a basic Excel form, maintain a register of your of the obligations you're subject to and who the relevant regulator is and regular and review that on a regular basis. That's a really good way to keep track of um, uh, your obligations and to feed into those regular discussions about, well, is this still relevant? Yeah. Do we need to um, update this? Do we need to, um, are we meeting our obligations? A lot of uh, government regulation, regulatory bodies have um, social media too. So that's another cheap and easy way. You just, just follow one of their social media accounts and if there's a, a legislative change, no doubt it will, be, um, it will be broadcast on all the social media channels of government regulators. So that, that's a really simple, easy way of um, staying across some things as well. Absolutely. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. It's been almost a full hour. We thank you very much for all your... Um, attention over the, the 50 or so minutes and we hope you've got a lot out of it. Um, ways to stay in touch with the ACNC, um, just that's a nice segue from the last answer to the question, is to sign up to email updates from on our homepage and the commissioners column. We've got lots of web guidance, video content and podcasts on the website too. Webinars such as this on other topics of course and if you have any questions you can email us, um, questions about your charity and operations and that sort of thing, email us at advice at acnc.gov. .au, and of course we're very active on social media too. And um, if you have any comments, questions or feedbacks about the webinar specifically, then shoot us an email to education at acnc.gov.au. We'd love to get your feedback on these um, these webinars and to ways to improve them and, and make them more useful for everyone. And on that, 
at the very end of this, once you close your webinar, there will be an option to do a very short survey. I think, it, I think it's only two, maybe three questions. It takes maybe 15 seconds. Um, if you could do that, that's really helpful too. We get a lot out of that and um, you can give us your comments about today's webinar in particular. So uh, once again, thank you for attending. Um, we look forward to seeing your um, attendance again at a webinar in the future. Thanks, Prue. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone.